delighted to be able to introduce our Philippine speaker today, Dimitrios Saltis. Dimitrios is a professor at the University of Arizona, but we've been lucky to have him as a local over the past year where he's a Radcliffe Fellow. Um, Dimitrios, as many of you know, is, is no stranger to the CFA. He was actually a CFA postdoctoral fellow after getting his PhD at the University of Illinois. Dimitrios is an expert in many things, including MHD turbulence, probes and tests of general relativity, interstellar scattering, pulsars, and more. But in particular, he's an expert on the Event Horizon Telescope, having worked on it since before it really even existed. And so uh, he developed some of the very first numerical models uh, for how the image of Sagittarius A star might look uh, if you can make radio images of it. And so those models have been guiding our theoretical, or guiding our interpretation of the VLBI observations ever since. So Dimitrios is now a EHT project scientist, and today he'll be telling us about the prospects for testing general relativity with the Event Horizon Telescope. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, full house, even though this is meant to be after the semester is over, so I'm really happy about that. And let me just start by saying that this was meant to be a talk um, for February. So I wrote it before anything happened, and then I looked at it again a couple of days ago, and then I realized that a lot of things have happened since February, which do not affect necessarily any of the tests of ZR, and I'm not going to show data, I'm not going to make any big announcement. But I figured I would add a little bit of an introduction about what, what has happened the last couple of months that brought all this excitement to us. And I will not spend any time introducing the Event Horizon Telescope for this group, just I will say one sentence in case you just woke up from a coma. Let's say that the Event Horizon Telescope is a collection of many, many millimeter, submillimeter telescopes all over the globe, anywhere from Hawaii to Arizona, Mexico, Chile, the South Pole, and uh, the Pyrenees and the European Alps. And it has a number of goals. The primary one, which is the one that I will be focusing on in this talk, is to take pictures, images, of two black holes, the one in the center of the Milky Way and the one in the center of the M87 galaxy with horizon scale resolutions. resolution. Because our goal is to probe the strong gravitational fields very, very close to the black hole horizon and that's why these are the main two targets I'm going to focus on today. In fact, I will focus primarily on Sagittarius A star, which even though it is a wimpier black hole compared to M87, it is much closer to us, it has a um, opening size of what I will find later as the shadow to be comparable to that of M87, but more importantly, it's because it's so close to us, we have so much more information about the black hole, much better measurement of the mass, much better measurement of the distance, and other probes of its gravitational field that will allow us to perform those tests much better than in the case of M87. And uh, I will focus on work that has happened with a lot of people probably half of the audience, so you will know at least half of the talk that I'm going to talk about. I just want to give a special note to the uh, group at the University of Arizona because a lot of the ZR test talks has happened, uh, work has happened there. Former and current graduate students, some of them are in the audience. Unfortunately, Tim Johansson has left the field, and these are the three main faculty members of the University of Arizona that are part of this group. Now, in between of the talk, I'm going to also give a couple of anecdotes about my particular contribution, not because it's meant to be the most important thing to say, but I think these are you know, my personal um, interaction with that. And even though I have been involved with the Event Horizon Telescope almost for a decade now, I think we met, I met Seth in 2009 at MIT after a talk there, so it's been eight years since uh, I've been heavily involved with the project. However, back in 2000, when I was a postdoctoral fellow here, I went into Ramesh's office, knocked the door the first day that I arrived here, and I said, hey Ramesh, do you have a nice project that we would like to work on? And at the same time, it happened that Ferial was doing the same thing, and that's how I ended up meeting Ferial, by working on a project that effectively helped us lost, develop all these ideas that we have right now. And the idea is that the reason that we go to 1.3 millimeters to do those observations is not because um, necessarily this is the place that we have the best angular resolution given existing telescopes on Earth or in space, but also because there is a number of other things that have to do with the black hole in the center of the Milky Way that make that observational wave and talk about. One is the fact that the peak of the emission is in the millimeter to infrared range, so you look where the source is brighter. Second thing is that the effects of interstellar medium that blurs the images is minimal when you go closer to a millimeter or sub-millimeter wavelength. 
the atmosphere becomes transparent, is transparent, you can't go any closer, but the accretion flow becomes also transparent and optically thin, and this was the paper that we wrote back in 2000 to identify what are the wavelengths where you can actually peek through the, all your way through <coughs> the accretion flow uh, into the event horizon of the black hole. And of course, that's something, at the time we did it with analytical models, now we can do it numerically. This is a work, a work done by um, C.K. Sun in Arizona, shows the accretion flow and uh, at a given wavelength, it starts from centimeters, goes down to millimeters, and the accretion flow becomes more and more and more transparent until you hit about one millimeter, at which point you can see the hole in the middle of the emission. This is the black hole shadow, this is what we're looking for, this is what the Event Horizon Telescope hopefully will image, and this is what we will be using to test center relativity around the black hole. Which is, is this constrained by data, or is it just a model? This particular model is actually consistent with uh, all the parameters of the model were uh, identified in a way that's consistent with all the data that we have as of today. As of before the observations of the AIDS thing, I don't know. Did we see jets? Now, the, the reason that you see those jets is because of the logarithmic scale. Most of the emission is actually this bright part here at low wavelengths. And I will show in a second something that is linear scale. This is just to show the scale of um, you know, tends to profiles that exist in the simulation. But when you go to a millimeter, most of the emission happens around the, around the shadow. So, of course, I'm a theorist. Having ideas is not enough. A lot of other people that I will quote in the second had similar ideas. Uh, what really needed was a SHEP in 2008 and 2012 to use a subarray and a number of other people using Hawaii, California at the time, this does not exist anymore, Karma and uh, the SMT telescope in Tucson to actually do those interferometric measurements for such a star in M87 and <coughs> provide the proof of principle by resolving the structure that what you actually have at 1.3 millimeters is a mission that has a characteristic size of a few Schwarzschild radii, which is exactly what you hope to see uh, in order to probe the strong gravitational field. Since then, a lot of things have happened, a lot of people built VLBI specific instrumentation, and this is Arizona specific, this is um, the 1.3 millimeter detector that was built uh, underneath my office uh, by Dan Maron and his group. And then those detectors had to be taken to remote locations to outfit telescopes, and this is Dan Maron and his students somewhere here, you can barely see, in the South Pole, at the South Pole Telescope. And then all those uh, telescopes have to be co have to be combined together with commissioning observing runs over the last several years that many, many people in the audience have actually put an enormous amount of effort putting it together and getting the ferrometric fringes. And as you can imagine, this was just for one telescope, the South Pole Telescope. We had met, we had those many, many telescopes in the collaboration, many, many people involved in developing the instrumentation, uh, instrumentation running them and commissioning them. And as of the last uh, year, effectively, there is a relatively large collaboration of people called the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration that involves many universities all over the world, many funding agencies. It's a very distributed um, project. And about 120 people that are actively involved in this collaboration. This is all of us, you can see Chef here, and you can point, maybe find yourself in this picture. Uh, this past December in uh, here in Cambridge during the last collaboration meeting and I we were about a little over 100 people um, in that meeting. Why did we get together this year? Well, because April 2017 was our target and this was the first, I would say, almost full array observational campaign that involves the, most of the telescopes of the Event Horizon Telescope. The Greenland Telescope and one in uh, the European Alps was not part of the campaign. This time we'll uh, join later on. But effectively all the baselines of the interferometer um, that we cared about, that everybody cared about, the lengths of them, were involved in this campaign. And this is a beautiful picture by David, David Sanchez at the LMP showing the uh, LMP telescope in Mexico what, during the observations as they say it's that you can see the center of the galaxy in the background. Now, the people that, most of the people that knew what to do with those telescopes were actually on the telescopes and spending an enormous amount of effort doing it. Two people that knew what they were doing stayed here and so did the rest of us that didn't know what we were doing, <laughs> know what to do with the telescopes. And uh, here's a picture of, as I said, these are the anecdotes from the personal contributions or personal involvement. This is the little room that uh, we um, 
put together with Seth and other people uh, at the BHI Institute, everybody sitting around looking at uh, weather information and arguing whether the weather is good or not for these observations. Let me say that this is the first time that I've ever done that, um, trying to figure out whether the weather is good in six simultaneous locations. And it was perfect always. And that means that either we were very lucky or the LBI people are whining too much about their weather. But you know, I mean, I'll wait for the next year to figure out whether we were lucky. And um, of course, this seems very high tech, but at the end of the day, we relied on things like this, where you know, we're keeping track of uh, what telescope and what the weather, and we were calling people to say, go out of the telescope and look at their clouds or not. And I think Lady was uh, involved in those conversations. Is there ice on the telescope? Many aspects, but the beautiful thing is that it worked. Enormous amount of effort by a lot of people that effectively allowed the full event horizon telescope array to observe not only those two, but the two prime targets for the historic sat star and M87 over multiple interferometric scans, five for sat star and 487 over a period of, period of a few days. And what was even more remarkable from the point of view of the theorist is that a very large number of other telescopes in multiple wavelengths, from low frequencies all the way to TV with through X-rays, were actually tend and observed sometimes simultaneously, sometimes quasi simultaneously with the event horizon telescope in order to provide a much broader view of what the accretion flow is around such a star and help us a lot in terms of our results. I really think that this was an incredible community effort, not only by the many, many people involved in the DLBI effort, but all the multi way campaign. So this is where things are, and I understand data are slowly uh, trickling into the correlators now, and we'll have to wait for a few months before we get actual correlated fringes and everything. So this is the point where I, you know, give you, leave you hanging with uh, anticipation of what will happen, and we'll tell you what we think we're going to use this data for, and how we're going to approach to gravitational fields. Yes. Why take a few months? Because data analysis. Uh, again, I'm not the right person to do it, but uh, to, to explain, Seb should say a lot more on that. But the first thing is that the, te the data have to literally be physically transferred by FedEx or whatever from the telescopes here, and the South Pole is closed for the for the season, right? So we have to wait until the fall for that. Then when that happens, the data have to be you know correlated and get in the ferromagnetic fringes out of that. And that is a story that requires a lot of sensing to figure out what is the optimal way to correlate them. After that, we need to do all the error analysis and calibration. And when all of that is done, I believe uh, Michael was telling me the other day, it's a matter of a minute and a half to press the button and get the image, which, you know. <laughs> it takes 10 years to get 100 data points, 1,000 data points, and a minute and a half to get uh, what we really need. But uh, it, you know, it is the process of uh, combining and collecting everything together. So as I said, the goal of our particular subset of the project is to use, general, uh, to use the event horizon telescope to probe strong gravitational fields. The EHT will do a lot more things, as you can imagine, accretion physics, jet formation, magnetic field uh, structure around black holes, you know, black hole feeding. But this talk is entirely about general relativity. So what I would like to point out is that we have to be a little careful when we talk about general relativistic tests because general relativity is a very broad theory, even though it's extremely simple to write on a piece of paper. And it has different regimes and different uh, types of predictions, so I would try to be a little careful defining what exactly we will do with the event, we hope to do with the event horizon telescope, and how it connects to other strong field tests around black holes that have happened recently. And a quick way to um, organize your thought is to realize that there are four types of tests in, that you can do with general relativity, and here they talk about the kind that we do with black holes. Depending on whether they involve static gravitational fields or dynamics, right? Whether you have an object that has a gravitational field that you probe it, you're in the closest stationary region. And when you have or objects orbiting around each other and emitting gravitational waves, you are in the radiative region. Mm -hmm. And in principle, those two probes two completely different aspects interconnecting of the theory. In the first case, you do metrics, you probe the metrics. In the second case, you probe the radiative structure of the theory. And now, depending on what to do, you can be in the weak field regime. So for example, for the case of black holes, it can, you can be doing ZR tests with a star or a pulsar around the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Or you can be in the strong field regime, take the image of the black hole shadow. This is a stationary test, but in the very strong field regime. 
And of course, you can do the same thing with the, the, in the radiative field. When you talk about neutron star systems or extreme oscillation spirals, you're in the relatively weak regime. And when you talk about LIGO sources, you're in the very strong regime. So these are four different ways that we actually have to probe the gravitational field of black holes. And our goal is to, as I said, to probe the metrics of a black hole. But in order to be, again, a little more careful about that, I just wanted to ask a very simple, simple question, which turns out to, be a, to have a very hard answer. What is a black hole? Right? We wave our hands and say a black hole is you know, a prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. But first of all, it is neither a unique prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And second, it is not the only prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity, as I will come back there to in a second. So let's define a black hole. Well, at the very simplest case, a black hole is primarily vacuum that involves a singularity that you can never see. And it's surrounded by a horizon. Right? Qualitatively, this is what we would call a black hole. Something that has a lot of gravitational field, strong gravitational field, but no matter around it. That's not very good, though. And it took about 20 years, starting from a beautiful paper by Ryan on Caltech in 1995, and a lot of us have worked in since then, trying to make that argument a lot more specific, quantifiable, in a way that allows us to make measurements and prove it right or wrong. And we will call a black hole any object that is described completely by the care metric. Right? This is, again, a subset of what it could be, but this is what we would call it. You don't include charge black holes. Yes, I, astrophysical, like Omega, as you have said, uh, Kevin or something other. We don't expect any uh, significant astrophysically relevant charge. I know that there's residual charges that you can always account for, but these are way under an observation. Level. And the way that we define it is, in principle, we can take the metric of any relativistic object and expand it to multiple components. It's a little more complicated because the theory of gravity is nonlinear, so it's not able how to do it. And if you have ways of measuring the coefficients of at least three of them, then you can tell whether the compact object is a black hole, a cat black hole or not. Because according to the Mahir theorem, we think that we know that there's only two types of information that the black hole can carry. And in this language, the monopole is the mass of the black hole, the dipole is the spin of the black hole, and the quadrupole is given precisely by minus spin squared. It's not a free parameter. So if you write a genetic space-time and you be completely agnostic about what is the kind of system that you're looking for, and somehow use observations, you need at least three observables, to measure those the lowest three moments, then you plot the spin and the quadruple of the black hole, the care space-time lies on that particular relationship, which is this one, and if your observations put the object that you're looking far away from that line, then you actually nullify the assumption, the hypothesis that the object that you're looking is an astrophysical care black hole. If it turns out to be on that line, then you provide more and more evidence that what you're looking for or what you're looking at is an astrophysical black hole, a care black hole. And of course, the immediate question you're asking is, this is a beautiful phenomenological way of doing it, but what if it turns out to be offset from that line? Then what do we learn? And I will be the first to say that it's not obvious for two reasons. The first one is, and this is an entire talk in many, many papers, but general relativity has an infinite number of solutions that are not care, like cold solutions that are not care. That we usually close our eyes, close our ears, and don't talk about them because they have a problem, and that problem is that they have closed time light loops, they allow time machines around them. They have naked singularities or both. And these are things that we do not know how to make physical predictions on. I wouldn't know how to write the outcome of an experiment when what happens now affects what happened earlier. Right? We cannot solve any cellular problems in those space times. And there's something called the cosmic censorship hypothesis that somehow no initial value problem in astrophysics will ever lead to those solutions, but that those are valid only solutions of the Einstein's uh, general optimistic field equations. The fact that we don't know how to handle them is not necessarily a reason not to consider them. But the other interesting point is that actually most of modifications to general relativity obey or allow the care metric as a solution. 
And again, an entire talk on this. It took us, you know, many, many, as and said a lot of people, many, many uh, years to understand the reason behind it. But effectively, if you find that something is a black hole, is a Kerr black hole, you cannot really tell that the underlying theory is um, relative. And for that reason, I'm going to do like everybody else, close my eyes, close my ears, and don't think about the implications, and say, let's go out, look at the data, measure the properties of the black hole, figure out if it is care or not, and then depending what happened, we'll think about it later. Okay, to make some progress. So, yes. question. In, in your definition, I'm trying to understand how that fits in, for example, with the LIGO uh, detection of GW. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's ask this wonderful question, right? About until about a year ago, uh, we would say that we only had, um, you know, not direct evidence for a black hole, but we always said that something is a black hole because it couldn't be any any obvious alternative. That's not the case anymore. LIGO, of course, observed gravitational waves from the lessons of two things that, you know, for any other, for any intense interpreters, looks like a black hole. How much information has LIGO given us about the underlying space-time of those objects? And let me say from the very beginning, I gave an ITC lunch talk a couple of weeks ago where I talked about how the Event Horizon Telescope and LIGO probe very different probe parameter spaces because one involves stellar mass black holes, the other involves supermassive black, mass black holes. So in principle, even if LIGO proved perfectly that these are care metrics. This still allows, you know, ask, allows us to go and look whether much, much bigger black holes are also described by the care metric. But let's ask that question. What did the really like to tell us about uh, the underlying space times? And of course, you've seen all this event. This is a maritime. This is a caricature of it, but these are meant to be the, the, the best um, gravitational wave profile from that particular event. And you have a region where you have the spiral of two black holes. They form, they merge, they form something weird, which eventually rings down, rings down, and goes to the asymptotic state. And the question is, is it possible to look, you can do much with the merger phase. It's extremely violent, it's extremely complicated, and very short-lived. But can you do something with the in spiral, or can you do something with the ring down to pinpoint the metric? And there's a couple of ways to see the level that with which you can do uh, this LIGO experiment. And one is, look for example at the lower two multiple moments of the space times, the way that you can measure for this extremely bright LIGO event. This is the mass and this is the spin. The inferred for the final one. This is based on the uh, uh, Boston spiral, this is the ring down, and this is based on the in spiral. And what you see, and this is nowhere to say anything bad about LIGO, right? This is a remark, that was a remarkable experiment, a remarkable um, measurement that was made, but what you see is that you can barely tell that the black holes are either spinning or not spinning. And this is just the second of the observable. Like, as I will show in a second, has practically no um, sensitivity to any higher order multiple. So any set of space times that produce this mass and this final spin will have the exact same gravitational wave you know, profile, which is what LIGO um, detected. And there's a number of reasons. First of all, is the increasing degeneracy between, the, between uh, you know, changing the, you know, higher order multiples and the mass and spin of the black hole. And the other is that these are extremely short-lived events, so you don't have that many cycles to measure. So, what if we don't look, what, yes? Just in the spirit of, of the test, Yes. Um, how is it, a test of general relativity if you do the measurement and it turns out not to be the Kerr metric, how do you distinguish between it being another solution, acceptable solution to general relativity versus a, a flaw, uh, however unlikely in general relativity? Uh, very difficult. It will depend on what the deviation is. And um, I would try to cross that bridge when it happens. Because as you said, it can be more than one thing. So it can be a different solution, it can be a different theory, and we don't know exactly how to do that. This is not that different from, if you think about cosmology, the dark energy problem, right? You um, find something that looks like a cosmological constant. Nobody likes it, nobody believes it, everybody hates it. 
but does it mean that you know you have to look for a solution to the you know parking problem, or do you have to look to a solution to a solution into the gravitational sector? Hard to tell after the fact. Right. But it will all depend on what the result is, and then if we find any potential deviation, hopefully we will develop additional tests to figure out what to distinguish between the two alternatives. We're not there yet. So how about we focus on the ring down? Because the ring down is simpler, right? You have a black hole that you protect, you gave it a click, and you let it ring down. And what you see here is that the ring down is, if you think of it in terms of Fourier transform, you know, it's something that very, very quickly decays, it has a number of characteristic ring down nodes that have a frequency, and they have a characteristic decay time. So if you can take the ring down signal and decompose it into the characteristic mm -hmm. nodes, and you measure three of them, then you can actually quantify the properties of the space time, not of the initial object, but at least of the final object. And again, this is something that was done very carefully. The like of uh, uh, work has been extremely careful with that by a number of people. This is just one of them by congressors and collaborators, where they calculated for various events, this is before the actual measurement, what is the signal to noise ratio that you would get from the ring down in the three dominant modes of the ring down as a function of the primary black hole mass and the binary mass ratio. And the reason the binary mass ratio matters is because if you throw a tiny grain of sand in the black hole, it will barely give it a little perturbation. If you throw something of order unity, it will make a very large perturbation. And what we see is that even though you can get the predominant mode relatively you know, nicely, even for relatively small masses, in order to get any of the higher order modes, like the second mode or the third mode, with signal to noise ratio of five, you really are talking about hundreds of solar masses black holes colliding and measuring whatever the little part of the gravitational wave in the LIGO, in the LIGO uh, wave and frequency. So again, a beautiful, beautiful result of the dynamics of the theory, but it tells us very little at this point about the properties of the underlying space time, what kind of vacuum objects are really coalescing. And the big question, do, do LIGO events actually provide, have any, carry any signal of the actual event horizon? And even that is not obvious. And there's some beautiful work by Vito Cardozo in Portugal um, this year after the original event, where this is the ring down phase. He doesn't do a coalescence because this is very, very difficult. He just has a black hole and gives it a kick and let it ring down. And he calculates it for warm poles, for empty cells, for gravel stars. And effectively, what you see is the identical ring down event with a little bit of reflection, some characteristic time afterwards. And if you throw that into the data, you actually have no way of measuring it with the light of the day. And the main reason is that what is really perturbing the peak of the emission of the gravitational wave does not happen from the horizon. In the horizon, everything falls in, all the gravitational waves fall in. The peak of the emission actually turns out to happen pretty much at the region of the photon radius, which would be very critical for the Event Horizon Telescope. So both LIGO and the Event Horizon Telescope are primarily predominantly sensitive to the properties of the space-time at the photon radius, which turns out to be unexpected but very interesting result. Answers your question. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the story you hear from, from the LIGO side is that what they measured is a, a large amount of mass in a very small region, and therefore that's enough to say that it's a black hole. But what you're saying, your definition is more, I guess, fine to fine or precise, or I don't know how, how to describe it. Among, it's different. Exactly. Among all the solutions of general relativity that allow for a very massive object inside its photon radius, among all of those, the ones, the only ones that do not have any pathologies that we know of today are is the care solution. Right? So if you're willing to say that this is the only solution that exists, you believe the cosmic censor, the censorship uh, hypothesis, or you believe if you're willing to believe general relativity, then that is a unique solution. There's no question about that. But our goal here is to test the cosmic censorship hypothesis effectively for general relativity, and then it's not unique. LIGO goes a step beyond that because you get two black holes and the horizons eventually merge into a single black hole. Correct. Right. That is a much stronger test of GR because the transition between two separate horizons to one is non trivial. Correct. The I I nobody has ever calculated this kind of events in any of the other space times for the exact reason we do not know how to do those calculations. Like the physics that we know does not allow us to perform those as an initial value problem. And there's 
going to be clearly other types of physics that resolve those issues, and I do not know the answer to that. But I agree with you. In principle, there's a lot of information that, you know, data, you know, the LIGO data, but as of today, that does not, I mean, it is something that is very specific to asking yourself of all the stable solutions which has going on that are consistent with the data, and that's clearly within that analogy. Mikhail, so I have yeah. a quick question. So LIGO, hopefully we'll see many, many more of them. So can you build the required signal to noise ratio? Can you make inroads by hitting a larger population? So the, that's what that paper was trying to do. Uh, trying to combine things from various, various, uh, you know, if you have a large number of uh, measurements. It was not obvious. It might be a way of doing it if you have hundreds of thousands of events. Uh, what they were, what they ended up going after is the Einstein telescope, or I mean, the other way that you can really do it with black holes that are comparable to supermassive, like EHT black holes, is LISA, because there you have much, much longer wave trains that you can actually do a much, much better measurement over longer time. So LISA, when LISA flies, that will be and works and sees EMRIs, that will be the end of the story. We'll have complete mapping of space. I'm worried though, uh, since you have two black holes to start with, uh, neither of them is both together, it's not a pure black a pure solution. So uh, that there will be a used black hole moment. Correct. All of that is taking into account in the spiral calculations. Yeah, so that, that since you brought up Lisa, how important that would be for Lisa then? So the reason why you want to do it in extreme mass ratio spirals is because the mass ratio is what determines those high order moments. Right. And if the mass ratio is large enough, like a stellar mass black hole into a billion solar mass black hole, then the quadruple is much, much, or the black hole itself is much larger than any induced multitude. I mean, as long as you're close enough. Okay? Okay. So, what will the HT do? Well, as I said, the primary uh, goal of the HT is to observe the shadow cast by black hole in the surrounding mission. And this is something that goes back to Zimbardin in the 70s, and uh, Luminette actually did a lot of uh, you know, initial calculations of how they look like. This is actually from the Luminette paper. And the idea is that if you have something shining from behind the black hole, like a flashlight, then these are, this is a simple simulation of what light will do. The light path, of course, gets bent around the black hole. And everything that is inside some impact parameter that you can calculate analytically ends up crossing the, re the radius of the photon orbit. This is what that dash line is, and eventually crosses the horizon, which is what that green line is. So if you were to look from the other side, all those impact parameters that are co color coded by blue will actually end up in the horizon, and the horizon will provide a shadow, will cast a shadow on the surrounding, surrounding mission. The two things to remember is that. The shadow is not the horizon. What the shadow is is a gravitationally lensed radius of the photon orbit. Right? So even though we call it the event horizon telescope, it's not really that. It's a photon radius orbit telescope, but that doesn't sound like a telescope. It's exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it the event horizon. It's hori event horizon telescope scale resolution image telescope. Right. And this, this, those original ideas were, of course, very specific to very idealized problems. So, I mean, that was really a picture from a figure from the uh, paper, a flashlight behind the black hole. This is not what we expect to have behind black holes. We expect to have accretion flows that are both behind the black holes and in front of the black holes, and a lot of relativistic effects. So, how does the black hole shadow is going to look in realis realistically? And I always like to show this for a very particular reason. You've all seen the movie. And uh, please, unless you make the disclaimer uh, that this is completely um, made up, do not show this plot. I find it irresponsible, actually, from, um, to uh, present this plot because it misses half of the relativistic effects on purpose because it's better for science. But on the other hand, now we're going to actually go out and take a picture of a black hole and would not look anything like this. And I do not have to argue why. Okay. So let's get rid of this and talk about um, some more realistic simulations from back when. And at the same time that Ferrell Ramesh and I were talking about the uh, transparency of the accretion flow, uh, Heino Falke, Eric Hagel, and Eagle and uh, Fulvio Emilia were actually uh, doing some initial full relativistic simulations of you know, relatively simple models of accretion flows around the Stereo A star, and they started 
seeing exactly what um, we expected for them to be a, a bright emission of hot plasma around a black shadow. And Adrian uh, Abby here, a few years later, actually um, started developing very, very uh, more detailed models based on fusion physics models and polarized and relativistic radiative transfer to start calculating uh, what the observational signature of black hole shadows are going to be like. And the important thing to notice for these particular models is that what you expect to see, you expect to see a crescent. The shadow is what I just described. The crescent is the part of the emission that is very Doppler boosted towards you. That's why it's extremely bright. And the part of the accretion flow that is pointing away from you is highly deep boosted, which is very, very um, low in um, brightness. And that's why what you really expect to see is like a half-sided um, shadow or a crescent in that case. This is where we uh, joined with all our other JLMHD simulations because we realized that we can uh, perform those calculations with a very, very, very high efficiency <coughs> if we tap on the uh, GPU technology, which is graphics processing units technologies in, you know, in your laptop, in your uh, iPhone, and whatever you want, which are built specifically for uh, ray tracing. Right? Graphics processing units are supposed to do ray tracing in three-dimensional you know, volumes, like when you do a shoot -em up game or you walk through a, you know, something for a movie. And effectively what we did is we hacked those GPUs originally, and of course it's a lot more um, elaborate with um, very well developed compilers to do the general optimistic radiative transfer in a massively parallel fashion. We started doing it on our laptops, and I think Ferial showed some of the movies of our postdoc uh, manipulating in real time that simulation. But what we ended up doing, we got a really nice present from GNSF a couple of years ago, and we built uh, effectively a cluster. This is when it's being built here at the University of Arizona with each node of the cluster having two Tesla CPU, um, uh, CPU cards. And each Tesla CPU card can run over 512 or 1,000 threads at a time. So this is really a massively parallel effort that allows us to do extremely rapid calculations. And when we first built the cluster, we were number seven in the BIM 500 list in the world, the fastest uh, computer, supercomputer per kilowatt of power used. And it is, uh, I find it very uh, interesting that there's no other North American institution here. Cambridge University is somewhere there, and some vaguely named financial institutions are uh, on that list. Of course, that list does not last that long. It lasted about three seconds, and then somebody else went and became number seven. But you know, we were very proud. We took a screenshot at the time, and that's what we shot. <laughs> and what this allowed us to do is combine our GPU-based ray tracing with the RMHD simulations, a lot of them being developed here by Oleg Sadovsky, uh, Ramesh Narayan, and other people. And what we're able to do is perform tens of thousands of those simulations overnight. And each one of those simulations allows us to calculate images at different wavelengths. So this is 0.8 millimeters, 1.3 millimeters and in the infrared. Spectra of the black hole in the center of the Milky Way and light curves for tens and tens of thousands of gravitational units, which could amount to about 60 hours of observing time. We developed this incredible, incredibly large library of possibilities. And we can also modify the space times, we can modify the plasma physics, we can modify many, many things. And then we asked ourselves, which of all those possibilities agree with the existing data? Here I just show you the spectral data, then you have to worry about variability properties, you have to worry about the initial image sizes. And we used that to pick a small number, five out of which I show two here, of models that are different enough to allow us to uh, understand what can work and what can go wrong, but also are completely consistent with everything that we know so far. And some of those models, the time-dependent models now of the accretion flow, are disk dominated, so primarily what you see is the Doppler shift part of the disk, and if you average that, as we show it in a second, it looks like a nice crescent. And some of them are dominated by the footprints of jets, and again, we do not have any evidence for any large jet for such stereo star, but this emission will not be significant further out. So this particular um, model does not have any significant emission, jet emission far away. But you can play with the plasma parameters in a way that is still consistent with everything that we know and make them one or the other. 
we do not think that the emission is for other reasons based on the ability that it's uh, footprints of sets. We think primarily it's going to be like what we have on the right. But that was the whole uh, exercise of going through this vast amount, like tens of thousands of models to work with. Yes? Um, because, um, can you go back to the prior slide? <coughs> I guess on the bottom part, I'm just interested to know whether the initial conditions are set right at the beginning of the simulation, or whether something happens, what you get a kind of flares in the light curve. Did you, is, is something, there's some, uh, um, uh, uh, some matter incident on the black hole in your simulation, or is that just like a natural evolution of the model? Um, again, that's a whole other talk. And, uh, <laughs> I will just stop it there, maybe in the next one, and point out something. Uh, the simulation actually started much, much earlier. Okay. We let it for thousands of gravitational radii to come down, because we start by feeding the torus far out, and we let it primarily equilibrate where we care. And then it keeps on going, keeps on going, just have turbulence, things moving left and right. And every now and then, you have a perfect magnetic storm. So magnetic flux tubes like to join and become bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at some point, you can barely see it here. You get a single flux tube, a very large flux tube that has developed. It's buoyant, so it's going to go away and give us an ejection of matter. But while it is behind the black hole, it gets gravitational lens. It will cause a cross-stick in some of those cases. And you will see a perfect Einstein ring around the black hole. And that will cause a big flare. So, we spent some time trying to understand whether those flares are consistent with the flaring activity that we've seen since Terry's A star. And it turns out that they are very consistent with infrared flares, but they produce no X rays. And in order to produce those X ray flares, you need to inject non thermal, like non -thermal particles, which are not part of the simulation. So we're developing a whole other uh, set of uh, simulations we have been developing that incorporate uh, non thermal acceleration from reconnection events to see how that uh, moves forward. In but the fun plan is that these are real magnetic flares that come out from the simulation. And spontaneous events. They're spontaneous events. We do yeah. not trigger them. Yeah. Of Can I just follow up? So it's a finite torus. To start with, yes. Start with. Is there additional supply, constant no. supply? No. Sitting there. So if you, and if you were where? What, what distance? 200 gravitational radii. Yeah. Is the thousand for this particular name is the thousand. Yeah, yeah. And right. the five is equal to amount to a few hundred. Well, why not the steady state? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, that, okay. yeah, so there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, when you fit something, you need to worry about what is the angular um, uh, distribution of the fitting at the outer boundary, and that affects the inflow outflow solutions. So we played with that in a different project quite a lot, and there's a ways, ways of doing it, but we didn't feel that that was relevant for this case. What we care here is what happens very, very close to the black hole. And as long as it's equilibrating here, we felt that that won't be significant. The other reason is that the, the two solutions that I showed here um, are what we call same solutions and mud solutions. This, these are solutions where the magnetic fields are very rapidly tangled, a lot of turbulence. These are solutions where you build significant magnetic flux um, very close to the black hole. And that's why you have those two principles that sliding out. And we know how to generate those solutions based on the torus initial conditions. So more than one ways. Also, these are the simulations that we had. <laughs> you know, there's many reasons to, to be there. To move forward. OK. So in any case, as I said, each one of those slides can be an entire talk. But the punchline is, we have ways in this red circle, of course, here is to uh, tell you where the shadow is expected to be. But we believe, based on the earlier work and the most recent work with the RMHD simulations, that there's going to be significant, uh, a very high possibility that the images that we're going to get in the next few months will allow us to see a shadow, a silhouette from the black hole, that the black hole casts on its surrounding mission. What are we going to do with that? And honestly, at the very beginning, uh, that was about 10 years ago, we thought that we can use that to measure the spins of the black holes. Because when you spin a black hole, just like when you spin any object, the space-time becomes oblate. And we figured by measuring the shape of the black hole and the size of the black hole, that will tell us something about the black hole itself. And ended up being that that was not the case. So let me quickly guide you through that argument. 
The first thing to do is spin up the black hole from 0 to 0.9999 and change the inclination with which you're observing it. And ask yourself, what is the characteristic size of the black hole? And it seems like a big variation because we zoomed in, so to see the effect, but it is really five gravitational units, J over C squared, give or take 4%. So no matter how fast you spin the black hole and the space-time becomes oblate and changes and whatever, the shadow that it produces is always the same. And this is kind of weird because when you spin the black hole, the photon radius is at 3m for Schwarzschild black hole, and it's at 1m for Schwarzschild for maximum spinning black hole. But what happens is that as you, become, as you crank the photon radius to become closer and closer to the horizon, it gets lensed more and more and more because what you see is the gravitational and the lens size of the black hole at infinity, or, or photon orbit at infinity, and the two effects cancel out to within 4%. So no matter where the black hole photon radius is in gravitational units, the way that you see it at infinity is always 5m plus or minus 4%. This is the level of the cancellation. And what is great about Sagittarius A star is that not only can we predict by the care metric that the photon orbit, the size of the shadow will be 5m, we know what m over distance in gravitational units is to an incredible accuracy. Because it's one thing to predict that size in gravitational units, it's another thing to predict it in milli arc seconds, micro arc seconds in the sky. But we have so many stars that are orbiting around an entire cluster, and in fact we have two stars, S2 or SO2 and SO38, for which we have closed orbits that we can use them, and the orbits of course depend on the exact same quantity, m over this, m over dz, m over dc squared. And people both at MP and at UCLA used improved, effectively, the angular diameter of one gravitational unit at the distance of the galactic center to 4%. And we know now that such a star 1m is 5.09 plus or minus 0.17 micro seconds. We know what that is observationally. We know what the prediction theoretically for the care metric is within 4%, and that is a parameter-free test of the care metric. Right? There's nothing that we can play with. We cannot change the distance, we cannot change the mass, we cannot change the spin, we cannot change absolutely anything, we cannot change you know, the inclination. It better be that what we measure has five times this angular size, give or take 4%, period. And we call that an alpha hypothesis of general relativity. I'm sorry, that, that's what I'm thinking. Yes, uh, once you increase the spin, is it remaining uh, circular or is it taking a different shape? Hold that thought for a second. Okay. And I'm not going to go through the exercise of how we can actually use image processing techniques to figure out the size of the shadow. There's more than one way of doing it. Which I just don't have the time to do it. But very recently, we uh, put that um, into a simplified view with uh, analysis of how we're going to do the Hunt Horizon Telescope data analysis, something that involves pattern matching because we know the shape and the size of the shadow analytically very accurately. And what we find is that we can quantify, for the models that we have developed, the GLMA3 models, we can quantify the opening size of the shadow to within an accuracy, given expected THD data, and if it looks like the way we think it would look, give or take 10%. Right. So, this is just a 10% null hypothesis test of general relativity, just by asking yourself how big the shadow of the black hole is. But what did we find? I didn't have to do any parameterized deviation. I didn't have to do any other metrics. I didn't have to do anything, right? This is just, is it what the R predicts or not? But what if it happens that it is not what the R predicts? And what if it happens that it's not circular, as I will show in a second? What do we learn? How can we do the experiment a little better other than null hypothesis? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that we're only doing metric measurements, so we just need to add parameters to our metric and make small changes to it. The bad news, as I said, is that the minute you play with the care metric, there's a very fundamental mathematical theorem in general relativity called the non-hair theorem that says that the only way to mess up your metric away from um, CR, from care is this is technical is to make it make it make it non-flat in the written sense to introduce naked similarity and to or to introduce close time like loops, timer sense. 
which means that we can perturb the metrics, but we cannot make any predictions. Right? That's where we were about 10 years ago. And that was a big problem because we wanted to see what if it is not a clear metric, what would they still observe? And that took, again, an enormous amount of work, which I'm not going to talk about because this is what you will need to talk about. And this is one of the PhD students' uh, papers. But this goes under the name of designer metrics. So effectively, what we learn to do with a lot of effort is to tweak our metrics and change our quadruple structure in a way that violates the Mohair theorem without introducing any pathologies. And the only way to do that, of course, is to go beyond general relativity. You cannot do it within general relativity. But that's not the problem. These are purely phenomenological empirical metrics on which we can now make predictions and ask ourselves how different would the shadow be had it not been general relativity. Had not been general. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Given that you know, there's also accretion physics that really pass parameters, uh, can you distinguish actually those two, whether your GR is wrong or you just have to Plasma parameters. Uh, absolutely. This is the best part of um, what we did here, which I didn't um, have time to show. That accretion physics determines the brightness of the emission. The black hole shadow, which is the sharp edge, this is these are two cross sections of the image. The sharp edge at the photon orbit is entirely metric. It has nothing to do. The accretion physics will change <laughs> the stuff here. The only thing that will determine the sharp edge there, the sharp gradient there, is pure gravity and nothing else. Except we don't know where the black hole is in reality. We do not we know we where don't have a point. We do not know where the black hole is, and that's why you want to do it in a different metric way. Especially there's a particular technique that Kaz and I have been talking a lot and doing some things recently called phase congruence that uses entirely different metric data to do that. And again, it's a whole other talk based on that. But yes, the punch line is that this is purely gravitational effects. We want the accretion flow to back illuminate the shadow, but the shadow itself has nothing to do with the accretion flow. So, can I guess, what, how, about, how about the orientation of the torus? That would add it? The the, you assume they're aligned? Uh, in our simulations, we assume they're aligned. There are other simulations that have inclined ones. The difference there, again, is not that by the time it hits the black hole, there's very little that you can do, right? The difference there, which might mess us up a little bit, is that perhaps the emission, the small 5M emission that Seth found, is not from the inner accretion flow, but is from um, the shocks of the inclined um, you know, accretion as it tends and becomes aligned with the black hole. So you're, what, even though what you're measuring is a very, very small emitting region, it's actually far away from the black hole. It's a pretty puffy thing, they don't align. Let's talk about okay, that yeah, in a second. I just want to uh, give you three more minutes now things uh, after that. So what was the point? The point that I made earlier is that as you spin the black hole, the shape and the size doesn't change. So this is the outline of the black hole shadow for a non-spinning black hole, nice and circular. And when you start spinning it, the only thing that matters is the shadow. Nothing really changes, but the shadow moves away. It's not centered on the black hole anymore without changing anything else. And why does that happen? That was an interesting, unexpected result. <coughs> that the geometry of the space time becomes oblate. So, what really the shadow wants to be is it wants to be oblate like this. But photons that go along the spin of the black hole with the spin of the black hole experience positive frame dragging. The photons that go the other way experience frame dragging away from them. And what that does is that the, the lensing effect, the effect of lensing on the frame dragging pushes one side of the ellipse to the other of the shadow to a perfect cancellation. And that perfect cancellation occurs if and only if the non hair theorem is satisfied. P equals minus h squared. For no reason that we understand it. Purely mathematical um, uh, pure pure mathematics. But now we can tweak those we can tweak our metrics away from that particular space time, the care space time, and fix the spin and change that parameter that measures deviation from the care space time. And effectively what you see is that the minute that you become 
you're not satisfying the, the noetherium, your black hole shadow, in this particular case, becomes non spherical symmetric. In other cases, that uh, my friend has worked since then, becomes larger or becomes smaller. So even though we will not be able to measure the shadow of the black, from the shadow of the black hole any properties of the black hole itself, because we know the mass to the distance already a priori, and the spin makes very, very little sense. This is one of those very unusual situations that we can measure deviations from general relativity without knowing much about the black hole itself. And again, following this particular work that we have done, this is the original plot that I showed, black hole spin, black hole particle moment. This is the GR prediction, the care prediction. We assume the particular value. We passed it through a very simple, if you wish, um, data analysis for what the HD is going to observe. And this is what we will get. Not be able to tell one or the other, but we can tell that it's not the way from there. So there's not much time to do you know, the other ways that we're going to do it using stars and pulses and all the work done here by, uh, with Avi and Pierre, who I think is in the audience. But the black hole in the center of the Milky Way allows us more than one ways, using orbits of stars and pulsars, to measure those two properties in the far field. The Event Horizon Telescope allows us to measure those properties in the near field. And hopefully, if everything works together, and pulsars provide a particular measurement primarily the spin, stars measure primarily the spin, the event horizon telescope measures a particular combination. And if they all turn out to line with what the care metric is or be far away, I think that will provide a very, very, very important, very different, very significant test of our understanding of what black hole the black holes are, whether they are the care space time and after all what is the underlying theory. So I better stop here. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, I'm just wondering how will you be able, how accurately do you think you'll be able to measure the asymmetry in the shadow from what's happening in the disk? The disk is also very turbulent, and we have all these simulations that. Actually so this is what, <laughs> this is the part that I didn't show. Um, the, the turbulence is useful because it's highly variable, and the shadow is fixed, right? And in principle, when you do the experiment today, tomorrow, the other day, especially for black holes like M87 that very, very slowly, then you should be able to always get the same answer. So by repeating the experiment, we'll be able to tell whether we are affecting what we're doing uh, because, of this, or because of the evidence. However, again, the only thing that will happen if I were to show you that plot with time dependence is that this part is going to go up and down. The brightness where the accretion flow is because of the uh, turbulence, but the sharp gradient will not. So what we're looking for, we're not trying to fit the part that we see in order to infer what we don't see. What we're developing are techniques to measure the sizes of the steepest, steepest gradient in the interferometric data. And the easiest thing to do, and you have written the paper that honestly kind of inspired me to do that. Uh, I forget when it was, a few years back. Yes. <laughs> uh, in the ferrometric data allow you very, very easily to convert from images to gradients, right? Because you do it automatically in Fourier space and you just multiply by a Fourier frequency. So if you were to take the data that gave rise to that image reconstruction or that image and instead calculate the gradient image, then suddenly all the things that move up and down and have shallow gradients become nothing. And the only thing that you see in these are two cross sections are very strong signals in the place where the shadow is that has the steepest gradient. So what we are developing are exactly techniques to focus on the place of the steepest gradient at any snapshot as the, you know, um, the, um, or the actual accretion flow evolves, and then point only at those places and measure the shape and the size. That's what allows us the 10% accuracy as opposed to trying to fit accretion flow. We try to avoid as much as possible doing anything with the equation flow for this test. The equation flow itself has wonderful things to teach us. Last question. Uh, so um, 
How important is the fact that it's illuminated not by the, uh, the rail parallel rays, but from from all directions from the compression disk which is nearby? So um, again, if you look at the image, I can make this look as uh, you know, sharp as shallow as I want, right? I mean, I was asking for how can you see that depends on the color palette that you're using. But if you look at the cross sections, you see that there is some significant emission from before, from in front, right? So indeed there is accretion flow everywhere. We don't expect to see much emission from far out because the temperatures in the field are all, are all wrong. So the emission is going to be from nearby. But what we're safe with is the Doppler slits, that the things that are on the side and in the back that are have the highest velocities as far as the photons are concerned are going to be by far the brightest. That's why this side is so much brighter compared to the emission on the front. Right, but you can be illuminated from the back and it goes around. That's, that's all taken into account. That's exactly all taken into account. And um, the reason that in the previous image you saw that one particular in the movie when I was talking to Jonathan, you saw that particular flag still appearing in more multiple ways is exactly because of the multiple parts of gravitational lens. I mean, you have multiple cost crossings, you have all sorts of things that are all Great. Well, as I said, Dimitrios is a local. Please get in touch with him for more questions, but let's thank him again. Given speed, yeah. this is the speed is okay. So, what you are saying is that like, this is going to feature the sky that does not depend on speed, um, too much, not to give it to you. Okay, and this is the great thing, right? And then, then this is the right, 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 okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then the dependent on incarnation, you have a dependent on incarnation, looking view incarnation, that's, that's the same, right? It's a very robust number, that's not surprising. Yeah, actually, the formula. Yeah, why? Why is it exactly? 